There are periods in which the latter determines historical development, not only in reality, but also as an inference from ideal convictions and an expression of a developing conception of society which strives toward perfection. But if, in the party politics of such an age, it is then concluded that, since all progress depends upon the growth of the socialist elements, their triumph will produce the most advanced and ideal state of things, this overlooks the fact that the whole success of socialist measures depends upon the circumstance under which they are introduced into an individualistic economic system. The progress resulting from the relative increase of socialist measures does not justify the conclusion that their complete implementation would represent further progress. It is the same with periods of increasing individualism. The significance of individualistic measures depends upon the fact that centralized socialist institutions continue to exist, these can be progressively reduced, but their complete disappearance would lead to unanticipated results differing widely from those that individualism had previously brought about. In the field of art, the contrary tendencies towards naturalism and towards mannerism show a similar pattern. At each particular moment in the development of art there is a mixture of simple reflection of reality and subjective transformation. From the standpoint of realism, art becomes more perfect through the growth of the objective element. But at the very moment when this became the sole content of a work of art the growing interest would suddenly turn to indifference, because the work of art would no longer be distinct from reality, would lose its significance as a separate entity. On the other hand, although enhancement of the generalizing and idealizing element may refine art for a time, it must reach a point where the relation to reality, which the idealistic movement was supposed to represent in a purer and more perfect form, is completely lost as a result of the elimination of all individualistic contingency. In short, a number of most important processes follow this pattern, the growing importance of one element leads to greater success, but the complete hegemony of this element, and the total elimination of the contrasting element, would not result in total success, on the contrary, it would deprive the original element of its specific character. The relationship between the intrinsic value of money and its purely functional and symbolic nature may develop in analogous fashion, the latter increasingly replaces the former, but a certain measure of the former has to be retained because the functional and symbolic character of money would lose its basis and significance if this trend were brought to its final conclusion. It is not only a formal analogy that is in question here, but the unity of the deeper meaning of life, which is expressed in this external similarity. In practice, we can only cope with the variety of elements and tendencies that make up life by allowing our behavior, in every context and at every period of time, to be governed by a uniform and one-sided principle. But in this way, the diversity of reality catches up with us again and again, and weaves our subjective striving, along with all those factors that oppose it, into an empirical existence which allows the ideal to enter reality. This does not imply a denial of the ideal, life is adapted to such absolute strivings as its elements, in the same way as the physical world is adapted to motions that, if left unimpeded, would have inconceivable consequences, but that, as a result of their meeting with counterforces, produce the orderly world of natural events. If the practical world is formed in such a way that our will is focused upon eternity and only attains the world of reality by being deflected and rebuffed, then here too the structure of practical life has predetermined the theoretical structure. On innumerable occasions, our concepts of things are made so unalloyed and absolute that they do not reflect experience, and only there. Qualification and modification by opposing concepts can give them an empirical form. However, these concepts are not for that reason. Thoroughly bad, it is precisely through this unique procedure of exaggeration followed by retraction in the formation of concepts and maxims that a view of the world which is in conformity with our understanding emerges. 
The formula, through which our mind establishes a relation with the oneness of things, which is not directly accessible, by supplementing and reproducing it, is in practice as well as in theory a primary too much, too high, too pure. It gains the consistency and scope of reality and truth only by means of restraining contrasts. Thus, the pure concept of money as the mere expression of the reciprocally measured value of things, which has no intrinsic value of its own, remains completely justified, although in historical reality this concept is consistently disparaged and limited by the contrary concept of money as possessing intrinsic value. Our intellect can grasp reality only as a modification of pure concepts, which, no matter how much they diverge from reality, are legitimized by the service they render in the interpretation of reality. The historical development of money from substance to function we have now to consider the historical manifestations of our theoretical constructions. The broad cultural ramifications of the nature and significance of money are to be seen in the movements that lead money towards its pure concept and away from its attachment to particular substances even though it never attains the goal that determines its course of development. Thus, money is involved in the general development which in every domain of life and in every sense strives to dissolve substance into free-floating processes. On the one hand, money forms part of this comprehensive development, on the other, it has a special relationship with concrete values, as that which symbolizes them. Furthermore, money is influenced by the broad cultural trends, and it is at the same time an independent cause of these trends. We are interested in this interrelation here in so far as the form of money is determined by the conditions and needs of human society. With the reservation that this process never reaches the goal, I shall now examine the growing importance of money as a function or symbol, which comes to overshadow its significance as a substance. On a more profound examination, the dissolution of the concept of money as a substance is much less radical than appears at first sight, for, strictly speaking, the substance value of money is also a functional value. No matter how much precious metals are appreciated simply as substances, they are in fact appreciated only because they adorn, distinguish, are technically useful, give aesthetic pleasure, etc., that is to say, because they perform functions. Their value does not consist in their autonomous being, but always in their performance. Their substance as such, apart from their performance, like the substance of all practical objects, is totally irrelevant to us. It may be said of the majority of objects that they are not valuable, but become valuable, and in order to do so they must continually emerge out of themselves and interact with other objects. Our sense of value is bound up with the effects that objects produce. Even if a particular aesthetic mood were to attribute objective value to the precious metals on the ground that their mere existence, quite apart from all recognition and enjoyment, enriches the world, they would never enter the economic system through this kind of value. In the economy all value is connected with performance, and it is an arbitrary way of speaking, which conceals the actual condition. To say that precious metals have a substantial value which is distinct from their performance as money. Every value possessed by precious metals as substances is also a functional value, with the exception of their function as money.